Hello, everyone. My name is Evie Lou Pine. Welcome back to my channel. And today I have another video for you all. Today, I want to talk about dealing with guilt and shame, specifically when it comes to exploring BDSM and discovering what your identity is within our community. The advice I'm going to give here also works for a lot of scenarios where you might be feeling guilt or shame, kinky or other wise. So feel free to take this and use it in your everyday life as well. That being said though, I think becoming comfortable with who you are in a kink context does present some unique challenges. It's much harder to get support from people in your everyday life. Authority figures you might otherwise trust, like a therapist for example, are often misinformed at best and tend to pathologize an interest in kink at the worst. Many folks are even afraid to talk to their spouses about this, with whom they would otherwise share everything. An interest in BDSM can be a deeply isolating experience, and this leads many folks to never talk about it, to never be able to even get the chance to have their inner desires fulfilled. And that is really sad to me. And I want to do what I can to help folks find the courage and confidence to overcome their guilt and hopefully move that one step closer to being able to live their best kinky lives. But before I start doling out advice on how to navigate these feelings, there is one factor I need to draw attention to. And it's that in my subjective experience, Guilt and shame around kink interests seem to be much more common and long-lasting in men than in women. In fact, in my personal life, I can think of very few women who have ever remarked that they have ever felt ashamed of their interest in BDSM. The one notable exception is women who grew up in repressive religious environments, and there are a lot of folks with that life history in the community. But even then, Usually, these women had long since started down the path of mentally freeing themselves from the confines of the rules they grew up with. By the time they got into kink, the bulk of their negative feelings had already been dealt with. And in cases where those feelings did remain, they didn't tend to stick around for as long once they were in the community. In my personal, subjective experience... I haven't seen the same hold true for men. Guilt and shame are not only more common feelings to begin with, but they also tend to persist for much longer. It also doesn't seem to matter what kind of environment these men were raised in. Conservative, religious, atheist, liberal, all of them generate their own specially flavored version of guilt. And these emotions affect tops and bottoms, subs and doms, and switches alike. I think there are a few reasons why this happens, and understanding these reasons is important for knowing how to implement the techniques I want to talk about here today. So, what might be making men more prone to longer-lasting guilt and shame around their interest in BDSM? I imagine the knee-jerk reaction is that you're going to assume it's because men are more likely to be dominants or tops or sadists than bottoms or submissives, at least if we're talking about the straight or pansexual BDSM scene. And I think that is an element of it. Most of us were told growing up that hitting other kids is wrong and that you should never ever strike someone unless you are doing so in self-defense. But I think young men get an even more specific and pernicious message that specifically hitting girls is wrong. If you hit your girlfriend, you are an abuser. We don't teach people that abuse is an environment of coercive control. We teach them that individual Acts are implicitly abusive on their face, striking someone or causing them pain, for example. This creates a double whammy of people not being able to recognize emotional abuse or mental abuse, and also it leads them to see certain activities as abusive regardless of context or consent. We are taught this so strongly from such a young age that someone could literally have their wife be begging them 
them for a birthday spanking, and they simply cannot do it. The voice in their head is chanting, but if you do this, you're a bad person. You are forever tainted and dangerous. And it is so strong. And side note, this is why I like the direction a lot of other kink educators are going when they talk to their own children. Just a simple change to don't touch someone without their permission leaves a much better mental impression, or at least it seems so to this point. And I believe a similar scenario also plays out for men who want to pursue power exchange relationships. If you grew up, in a conservative environment especially, and especially as well if it was religious and you wanted to be a dominant, then you're no better than the controlling patriarchs you grew up with. Despite your best efforts, you found yourself walking the same twisted path they laid out for you. You might be wondering if you want to be a dominant for the right reasons, and if the toxic, overbearing behavior you despise might somehow leak out if you go too far with your power exchange. So sometimes it's easier to decide to not be dominant at all, just on the off chance that your upbringing has a bigger impact on you than you realized. For people who grew up in more liberal environments, pursuing a dom-sub relationship with a woman where you're the one in control can feel like a betrayal of the values that you were instilled with since you were born. If you believe that women are completely equal to men and deserve to be treated with respect, what does that say about you? That you want to have power over a woman, whether that be inside or outside of the bedroom or both. Can you really call yourself a feminist or an ally to women if you want your partner to call you sir and then sleep in a cage under the bed? There's just no winning, no matter how you were raised or what values you have now. And it doesn't get any easier for submissive men either. (laughs) In fact, they've got a lot of their own special issues. They have a unique combination of societal garbage to deal with, if I'm being honest. I've talked before about how submissive men are often made to be the butt of the joke. Almost every TV show that references BDSM in an episode goes straight for the submissive men are freaky, weak-willed little wimps who all wear gimp suits. It's just their thing for some reason they always go right for. I Idealized masculinity leaves no room for being the receptive partner, let alone being the one who follows orders rather than making them. Even mentioning an interest in things like pegging is likely to get you laughed at, and you have to have a really supportive friend group as a man to be able to broach topics like this in the first place, at least most of the time. Not to mention how many women are completely turned off by their partner saying they'd like to try something like foot worship or humiliation. And that can quickly go beyond mere rejection and into, oh my god, that is so gross territory. No one wants to hear something like, you know, I I just can't see you the same after you mentioned wanting to try insert kink here. We should probably break up, actually. I'm sorry. Rejections like this become so common that it's not only easier to not mention such interests at all, but it's also easier to blame yourself for being like this. If you could just be normal, you could have a real relationship. You could be a real man, TM. You might be able to find someone to actually love you. Guilt and shame become tools to try and wedge yourself into the normal box. Maybe if you just beat yourself up enough about it, not like that, (laughs) you'll get rid of those silly, kinky thoughts. There's just no place for you to turn for emotional support. Not your loved ones, not your male friends, not your love interests. When everyone is telling you, either through implication or explicitly, that your interests are bad and make you unlovable, you start to believe them. And none of this is to say that women don't face their own struggles with guilt and shame around their sexuality or kink. Speaking as a woman, we definitely have our own issues. I just think that we happen to have some tools for dealing with these issues that modern masculinity doesn't give to men. 
For as much as I critique modern pop feminism, it does have some silver linings to it. The watered-down version of sexual liberation, which often amounts to if a woman freely wants to do something, that thing is feminist, is pretty dang helpful for coming to terms with a desire for BDSM. There are also very few things that a woman can do within kink that would cause others to view her as having lost her womanhood, whereas the list of things a man can do within kink that would cause others to view him as no longer being a real man is about a mile long. Women are also much more likely to have supportive social networks. Not all of us do, of course, but it's much more likely that a woman talking to her friends will find at least one who will say, hey, you know, that's not my thing, Susie, but have fun, girl. And of course, they often love to live vicariously through Susie's subsequent kinky adventures. (laughs) It's like, their favorite hobby sometimes. In any case, I hope that you all can understand that I'm not trying to say that all women experience X, or all men go through Y, or women always have it easier than men, or vice versa. Everyone has their own unique individual experience, and I can't hope to cover every possible permutation. I just wanted to highlight what I see as common experiences with guilt and shame and how that might relate to gender and how we're socialized. But I have also been saying the words guilt and shame a lot so far in this video. Without defining what they mean, and you all know how much I love to do that, so what exactly are guilt and shame? On this subject, I'll defer to the famous shame researcher Brene Brown, who has an article on her website summarizing the difference. Quote, I believe that there is a profound difference between shame and guilt. I believe that guilt is adaptive and helpful. It's holding something we've done or failed to do up against our values and feeling psychological discomfort. I define shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. I don't believe shame is helpful or productive. In fact, I think shame is much more likely to be the source of destructive, hurtful behavior than the solution or cure. Shame is an inherently social phenomenon. Shame causes us to believe that we are less than what we should be, that we will be rejected, and that on some level we deserve to be isolated because something about us is wrong or bad. It doesn't take an expert to point out that this can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. People who feel deep shame tend to self-isolate, reinforcing the belief that they deserve to be alone and will be alone. And if they do socialize, they might act in ways that push people away. They might lash out, put themselves down regularly, become defensive very quickly, or otherwise act emotionally dysregulated in a way that other people generally can't tolerate being around for long. This can be a subconscious mechanism used to feel a sense of control, in my opinion at least. You know, it's like, I'm not being rejected, I scared you away on purpose. It's a sort of emotional, you're not firing me, I quit reaction. Guilt, however, is a much more internal experience. Guilt arises when there is a mismatch between our values and beliefs and our actions. This reveals the core difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is when we believe our behavior is wrong. Shame is when we believe we are wrong. Guilt can also cause us to isolate, but it tends to manifest more in avoidance. We feel guilty for hurting someone else's feelings, so we avoid seeing them, and therefore we also avoid having to apologize and make it real to ourselves and others that we did something that betrayed our values. Or if we do apologize, we might use weasel words to avoid accepting full responsibility. If someone has ever apologized to you by saying, I'm sorry you felt that way, you've experienced this. When left unaddressed, guilt can become a positive feedback loop. We feel guilty about doing something wrong, and then we feel guilty we didn't fix it, and so on and so forth. At this point, 
I think the natural desire would be to want to shove these emotions away. Feeling guilt and shame feels bad, and I don't want to feel them, so I should try as hard as I can to get rid of them or bury them. And, I mean, does that work? Like, long term, I mean. Can most people successfully deny and bury their emotions for long without them eventually coming out? I believe that in order to deal with guilt and shame, or really any other tough emotion, we need to take a different approach. Brene Brown says in her article that guilt is adaptive and helpful, and the discomfort it creates can motivate us to change. It can lead us to act more in line with our values. Shame warns us that our desires or behaviors may cause us to be rejected by people we care about or that what we want to do falls outside social norms. Emotions, even negative ones, again, in my opinion, contain useful information. I think we're missing out on useful data points if instead of listening to emotions, we pretend they aren't there or will them to go away. Keep in mind that listening to emotions is not the same thing as agreeing with them. And bear with me here. This is going to sound a little woo-woo, but my preferred technique is to go through a very simple two-step process when I am dealing with a big emotion. The first thing I ask is, what am I feeling? A suggestion that I am sure seems completely unnecessary to some, but trust me, do not skip this step. Shame and guilt, like jealousy, tend to be painted over with other emotions first. On the surface, they can seem like anger or fear. When you pause to reflect for a moment, you realize those aren't quite what's going on. This is important because anger and shame, for example, are addressed in very different ways. This is also a worthwhile step because a lot of people struggle to identify or express their emotions. It's so common, it's something that about 10% of the general population struggles with. And if this is you, I will have some resources linked down below that can help you through this step in particular because I know it can be difficult and asking a lot to be able to do this. I'm aware of that. Then, after I've walked through identifying the feeling, I try to visualize the emotion in my head. Okay, this is where we get real woo. I non-judgmentally, as best I can, ask, what are you trying to tell me? Or, what are you afraid of? What do you think I'm not paying attention to? Fair warning that this kind of personification is not going to be for everyone. I find it to be very useful, but if it doesn't feel safe in your body, don't do it. If you don't want to close your eyes and ask something, you can write it down, you can draw, you can paint it, you can sketch it, you can say it out loud to yourself in the shower, or talk about it with your stuffed animal. What works for me here is just having that dialogue of letting the emotion know, hey, I see you, I got you, what, what's going on here exactly? That by itself often allows me to start to feel better. I can start to relax in my body. If you're more comfortable with a non-personifying route, you can do this same exercise by restating the two questions as, what am I feeling right now? And what purpose do I think these emotions serve? For guilt, the answer to what are you afraid I'm not paying attention to is often something like we did something thoughtless and need to apologize or we did something wrong and need to be sure we won't do it again in the future or we've been doing something that goes against our values and we're afraid it's going to become a habit. Now note, I am using we here because the personified emotion is still part of yourself. For shame, the answer is often something like, no one is ever going to love us if this is what we want. Or, if someone ever found out about our desires, we would be ruined. Or, we're a bad person for having thoughts like this. You may also discover answers that are more specific to your life history or relationships as well. These are just examples. But what do we do once we've identified these thoughts? It's worth evaluating next whether or not these feelings of guilt or shame are justified or not. Remember, all emotions are valid, but they don't always suit the facts of a situation and thus are not productive to act on in the ways we may impulsively wish to or the way we may be habitually used to acting on them. So. What makes guilt or shame justified? Shame is justified if we have a legitimate belief that we will be rejected by people we care about if the source of our shame is revealed. Guilt is justified when our behavior violates our values. It's 
a little more complicated than this, but I'm going to stick to speaking about times when it is neither justified nor effective to act on our emotional urges. Urges, for example, being like the urge that shame gives us to want to hide. And this is the big idea now. How can you work through guilt or shame so that hopefully you stop feeling this way anymore after a period of time, or at least you feel it less intensely? Number one, or both, is to be open about what makes you feel guilty or ashamed with people who will not reject you. If you don't have people in your life who you think will accept you, then your goal should first be to find a group of people that will accept you. There are all kinds of FetLife groups, Facebook groups, Discord chats, online munches, and tons of IRL events you can check out to find like-minded people. Seeing people who are like you, who are good, adjusted, happy people, who are honest about their whole selves can be radical for your self-perception. If someone who's like you can be happy and open and have relationships and do what they want, why can't you do it too? If you don't have anywhere else, my comment sections and my live streams are always here to be supportive for you. And if you want to do this on hard mode, you can work to change the opinions of those close to you too to make them into the supportive group that you need. This includes gently introducing your friends, a partner, or family to the concept of kink, talking about the importance of consent, that it doesn't make you a bad or dangerous person, and so on. There are a few books about broaching this topic I'll reference down below if you want to go about this process. Again, it is hard mode, so proceed with caution here. Now, number two is where it also tends to get difficult for everyone, and that is you have to keep doing the thing that makes you feel guilty or ashamed. Keep going to munches, keep practicing your bondage at home, and see then that the world doesn't end. See that people still accept you and care about you. And don't be afraid to lean on people for verbal support either. Ask them directly if they still like you and respect you, if you are sure that the answer will be yes. Give your brain direct evidence as much as possible that the thing that you are so afraid will happen isn't happening. And don't apologize for who you are. You are a fine person just the way you are. Don't say sorry unless you mean to say sorry. Just being into kink is not a time to apologize. This is really where I see people mess up when trying to bid for acceptance. They will couch their kinky confession in a mountain of sorries and make it seem like a really bad thing they should be apologizing about. Don't do that to yourself. Be proud, be direct, and make eye contact. Tell yourself and the other people you're around that this isn't something you're cowering away from because you don't have a reason to. People respond to the emotional content in our words and our body language. If we communicate with downcast eyes and a hunched body and mumbled words and a truckload of, I'm sorry, but we are telling people around us that we are feeling bad, and that we should probably be treated like we are doing something bad and that we deserve sorrow and pity. So let's go through a quick example here. Compare how it sounds when I'm trying to talk to someone about kink like this to a second example. Um, uh, so, um, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, I just, I mean to tell you this really weird thing, and you're, you're definitely gonna hate me after I talk about. Oh God, I'm so stupid. I'm I'm just I'm sorry. I can't do this. I'm. Oh God, it makes me so nervous. I'm so so sorry. Versus, you know, hey, uh, so and so. Just so you know, I'm going to something called a munch on Friday. It looks so cool. Do you know what that is? I would love to tell you about it after I go, if you'd like to hear more. I just decided I really wanted to explore this aspect of who I am, and it's so exciting where my whole life is going. I hope you'll enjoy it with me. And hopefully you can see that between those two, there is a huge difference. Don't beat yourself up if you sound more like the first one, okay? We've all been there. Take time to practice. You have time to practice if you want to have these kinds of conversations. Talk to yourself in the shower. Talk to someone non-judgmental or to your dog, your cat, or something. Practice it because practice will make it easier in the future so you can be a healthier, better communicator. And finally, 
the most important thing you can do, especially for shame, is to validate yourself. Listen carefully to your feelings and honor them. Even if they feel irrational in the moment, you can remind yourself that for right now, they are real and powerful and they do affect you. Remind yourself of your inherent worth as a person, that you are good. Directly counter those shame narratives you have in your head. Reframe those thoughts and have empathy for yourself above all else, right? If you have thoughts like, I am a bad person because I like kink, you can shift that to something else. Maybe you can say, for example, I'm nervous about exploring kink because I'm afraid of being rejected. That is much more true and it removes the connotation that you are a bad person because of who you are and what you want to do because you're not wrong for what you want to do. I mean, maybe outside of some very specific cases, in which case, if that's you, I recommend appropriate mental health care. And now is as good a time as any to remind everyone I'm not a mental health provider. I don't have any training in this outside of my own and my own process I've been going through for the last couple of years. But with all of that being said, I hope that you all enjoy this. I would love to hear your thoughts in a comment down below, especially if you are someone who has dealt with shame in the past or with guilt. How have you processed that? What helped you work through it? Or are you still in that process right now? I would love to hear all your thoughts and feelings again in a comment down below. If you did enjoy this, you're not already, please do subscribe because I make videos twice a week about all sorts of different kink and BDSM related topics and fun. Finally, if you want to support what I do, the best way you can do that is with Patreon. Link to that will be down below. If you do already support me over there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you all next time, I hope you have a great yesterday and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.